Well, thanks for having me come here today. Uh, I guess I describe you as having the uh, bailing wire and duct tape guy follow up here at the end. Um, you got me up here, boy. I know you're really stretching to to find a to find a grower. Um, unlike the a lot of the previous speakers, really the amount of ground that we have in organic sustainable production is pretty small. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, if you're a smaller producer and you've been sitting through all this today, and even me, I've been a little bit awed by some of what I've heard. These are pretty big farms, very successful growers. Anyway, look at what I'm doing because if Eric and Cheryl can do it, anybody can do it. So anyway, take heart, take heart. It's uh, pretty basic. Um, we have two farms basically on our place. We have a 1,300 acre industrial farm where we raise winter wheat and spring wheat and spring barley. And then our sustainable farm really only is influenced by about 50 to 75 acres. The two farms kind of cross over every now and then on the acreage. We only really have 10 acres of certified uh, organic alfalfa. So we're just really getting started uh, per se in organic production. And uh, one problem with my certified organic alfalfa is it's been so successful we've been very reluctant to take it out and grow grain on it because we're making too much money on the, uh, the hay feeding it to our, uh, our sheep flock. But basically, um, uh, my dad runs the industrial side of things and my wife Cheryl and I run the sustainable side of things. Uh, we produce a lot of pastured poultry. We produce about 700 broiler chickens a year, have been as high as 8 to 900, about 100 Thanksgiving turkeys a year as, as well as about a hundred uh, locker lambs which we sell both to a conventional market through Potlatch Pack and Potlatch Idaho as well as the uh, ethnic market to uh, some Muslim friends of mine. They take about a third of our lamb crop every year. Uh, we also have a burgeoning feed business where we're selling feed now to about 25 to 30 other small farms and that's been a good, uh, good market for us. It is conventional feed, it's not organic. Uh, one thing here in eastern Washington that we sort of uh, have to uh, keep in consideration as far as the feed sales is what can our producers sell their broiler chickens for. Unlike western Washington where they're getting four to five dollars a pound for those broiler chickens, right now our price this year as well as last year has been three sixty a pound. We find resistance in buying those broiler chickens as you approach four dollars. So we try to keep our prices reasonable. Turkeys are around three twenty five a pound. There again we're holding our prices down so consumers can afford it, but thusly we have to hold our feed prices down so our other poultry producers who are buying from us can also afford to sell at those levels or at least nearly, nearly at that. Um, as far as crops on our farm, again, I had mentioned the wheat. Uh, this photo right here is of some camelina, which we tried this year. Uh, we won the first time. Uh, in, the, in addition to the uh, uh, giant white turkeys, we also raise heritage birds as well for a premium market. However, we're going away from the heritage birds because uh, we can't hold them in the pens anymore. We're just finally tired of them flying out. Uh, basically, we've been clipping the wings a couple of times on these birds, and they still get out uh, after their feathers regrow for the third time. So, uh, but anyway, turkeys have been a, a good market for us. Um, as far as uh, challenges in uh, organic and no-spray small uh, grain production, uh, this is a picture of uh, some hard white wheat that we grew a couple years ago on a, on a small track just to see how it would work. Um, Fertility has been a challenge. Um, one problem with uh, raising organic wheat is, you know, where am I going to find affordable fertilizer? And this particular plot was grown with uh, probably about a ton and a half of mule manure, mule manure per acre off my draft team, uh, really trying to keep the inputs basic and not buy inputs that either we think aren't going to be available in the future or are currently too high priced. So I guess to say I'm, I'm pretty darn tight when it comes to my fertility and my inputs. Uh, other challenges, of course, are weeds, just like anybody else. That's probably our number one challenge. We've been following pretty closely what Ian Burke and Pat First have been doing on the Boyd Farm, which is really only eight miles away from us. They've been doing a lot of good work. Um, unlike the Boyd Farm, I don't have those fancy schnancy Phoenix harrows and uh, uh, various other types of harrow. What's the rotary harrow, right? It's the other one that you use. Because basically uh, when I'm uh, out there uh, doing the work, I'm using a guy like this. Um, I'm big into sustainable uh, energy production. Basically this is a solar tractor right here. This is my single draft mule J. And we do a lot of harrowing, uh, both with Jay and my other Molly team, Katie and Rody. And uh, we go out there and try to harrow at uh, specific times uh, so we can uh, try to control the weeds and really time those harrowings to, uh, to do the best job we can. And we're just using a five-bar flex harrow. I will hit it usually a couple of times with these guys when I'm doing it. I think pretty confidently if we can get our, our system going and we can increase our organic production, we can probably harrow probably upwards of 50 to 75 acres with the mule team. 
And uh, unlike trackers, they actually don't leave much of a footprint. So really, they're a pretty good, pretty good tool, and I love doing it. You know, like Bob said this morning, uh, you got to make sure that it's fun, and and this, it is a lot of fun using the uh, using the draft animal. So that's Jay right there. Uh, another component, of course, is our, our sheep operation. As I mentioned earlier, we raise white dorper sheep. They're a hair sheep developed in South Africa, and uh, this is a couple of dorper rams. Um, they're ideally suited for our, our production system. Basically, six months out of the year, we're running these sheep on wheat stubble. And we use a little three-wire electric fence system. Our sheep basically are grazed all over the farm, and we move that fence depending on where the stubble is. Uh, in the spring and summer months, of course, we, we pasture lamb. And uh, after the lambs are born on pasture, we'll actually move our lambs to our uh, green manure crop. Uh, we raise Austrian winter peas to uh, enhance soil fertility ahead of a grain crop. And what we're doing there is basically we're grazing off about half of the Austrian winter green manure crop with our sheep so we get a return on it. And the Austrian winter peas are coming on at a time, usually June 1st to about July the 5th, when my sheep need a lot of high nutrition. And they're actually, of course, adding back to the soil through their urine and poop. And I'm getting a usable product. That's meat and milk off of, those, off of those Austrian winter peas. So basically, rather than just sacrificing that year to green manure, I'm actually turning it into something useful as well as for soil fertility, and then I'm producing lamb with it. So that system's worked real good for us. And again, the little three-wire electric fence system that keeps the predators out, keeps the sheep in, seems to work real well. And so we're, we're real happy with that system. I mentioned the pasture poultry. Uh, oh, there's Katie and Rody uh, out doing a turn out in the middle of some CRP as we go back into Harrow some more. Uh, just like Bob mentioned, and well, Eric mentioned, and I'm sort of more, more to a degree as well, uh, kind of the heart of transitioning organic ground is uh, alfalfa. And in our case, we like the alfalfa grass mix. And the reason we like the alfalfa grass mix is that it seems to be a little bit more aggressive in, com in competing against weeds. Um, one problem that we have in the Pullman area in the 18 to 22 inch rainfall zone where we farm is that when our hay is ready to cut, it's usually a really lousy time to put up hay. And typically what really makes the bumper wheat crops in the Palouse country is you know, May and June rain. Well, you know, a lot of this hay is ready probably about the first week of June or the end of May. But if we try to drop it at that point, we're just going to have a moldy, rotten mess. Basically our weather really doesn't dry up for good hay making until the end of June. So typically we're cutting this hay around June 25th, even as late as around July 4th. Well, by that time, it's too big and it's too coarse. So we really can't raise good dairy quality hay uh, in, in our case. But never fear, I have a real, real need for a lot of that hay with my sheep flock. So anyway, we feed most of our certified organic hay to our sheep. And uh, we dole that out usually during uh, pre-lambing period when ewes uh, have a great need for better nutrition as well as uh, using it for our feeder lambs uh, when we finish them during the winter. Because our feeder lambs are born out on pasture during the late spring and early summer, um, we have to finish them during the winter on organic hay. We just can't have our cake and eat it too. I'd like to have grass-fed lambs, but we really don't have any grass to feed to them during that midwinter period. So, uh, but anyway, uh, that's Ladac alfalfa and Nanchar smooth roam. So just like Eric mentioned, the Ladac is really a good variety, and we're really, really happy with it. Tried and true. A little concerned about the GMO alfalfa coming up, but there's a round bale uh, operation there. That's what we put all of our hay up in. This is a chick brooder where we uh, brood our baby chicks uh, prior to going out on pasture. Uh, there's mules in. There's the sheep out on uh, grazing some, uh, I think that's uh, the alfalfa field at one point where they, they kind of whittled it down, eating all the alfalfa and the brome tend to sticking up. Here's another interesting crop, camelina. We're just like Bob. We're kind of interested in uh, sustainable fuel production. And uh, on farm, I think it's the way to go. I think Bob was right on track, so I'm really not going to add much to it. Um, as long as you don't transport this stuff long distances and try to industrialize it, I think it's going to be most useful on the farm. So uh, that's Camelina. There's a turkey herder. That's Cheryl. Uh, prior to Thanksgiving here a couple days ago, turkeys hurt real well, by the way, with our big, long turkey whomping sticks. We don't hit the birds. We walk the ground with them. And one person like this good wrangler here can move about 100 head of turkeys just about anywhere with a couple, a couple long pieces of plastic pipe. Uh, we've tried pastured hogs in the past. Here's pastured hogs out on, uh, out on Austrian winter peas. I don't think we had the right breed of hog. They mostly just partied down by their feeders and made a mess and uh, never really went out into the peas. So pastured pork production didn't, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't last too long. Uh, there's our grain warehouse, by the way, uh, where we store all of our grains and market our feed out of, and then, of course, sheep grazing stubble. 
uh, just adjacent to it behind the three-wire fence system in the fall there. Uh, turkeys, again, you'll notice in the background our hoop house. Uh, that's what all of our poultry is uh, housed in and uh, makes really good, good, good poultry houses. Basically, it's three stock panels bent in an arc with a heavy-duty tarp over the top on a 2x6 and 4x4 board frame. And these things will survive a wind load of up to 80, 90 miles an hour. Unlike uh, pearl, uh, PVC pearl and pipe hoop houses or, uh, or conduit hoop houses, you've got that metal lattice work right there that's really stiff and really strong. And when you put a tarp over that, it makes it really, really stable. And we have a heck of a wind load there where we, uh, where we farm. There's some use out on winter stubble, of course. Like I said, this time of year, they're out on wheat stubble all winter. We do supplement with uh, kind of low quality waterway hay. And uh, here's a good picture of our pasture poultry operation. Basically, we've moved from this Joel Salvatin type system with mobile pens to these uh, gazebo type setups between or in between the houses. And basically, right now, when we have it set up in a, in a full four hoop house arrangement, it's covering about a quarter of an acre. We only move this pen about once a week. And uh, that's been better than the Salvatin system where we had to move the pens actually daily. But we've noticed better gains with our pol with our birds uh, in this open house system. You know, and during, with the Soliton system, the birds are locked in the house, and the house is moved daily. Of course, with this system, the birds are free to range over the entire pen. So less death loss, better gain, happier birds. And uh, I think the birds also stay cleaner this way too. So we're real real happy with this uh, with this system for our broilers. Uh, there's Jay pulling a sled for a little recreational time. More trees on stubble. Here's our guard, uh, guard llama scooter, uh, also a very good guard. He's the backup, so if coyotes get through the little three-wire electric fence, a uh, scooter is sure to put the sheep into a safe area where, where they won't get eaten. Uh, again, here's a, more of a current picture of our pastured poultry quadplex system with the gazebos in the middle suspending the, uh, the netting, fed, netting over the top. And I, I forgot to mention the netting. That's heavy-duty bird net, and uh, that keeps the hawks and owls out of the chickens. Uh, stops the aerial attack. And then, of course, all these pens are surrounded with electronet system that keeps some uh, keeps coyotes out. And there's Eric and Jake, and that's it. Thank you.